Our Lady of the Flowers by Jean Genet with an introduction by Jean Bossat. I'm going to read the introduction afterward. It's quite long, and frankly, I'd rather not have the book explained to you all before you've listened to it. So, whereas I personally find that prefaces and introductions are all quite well and good, uh, when they exceed 70 pages, I just think that it's a bit much. We can do with the analysis after reading a thing, but certainly not before. I think it's always best to form your own judgment before you are prejudiced by someone else's, particularly someone who is as uh, strong as Jean-Paul Sartre, strongly opinioned, I should say. All right, so, the dedication. Were it not for Maurice Peloche, whose death keeps plaguing my life, I would never have written this book. I dedicate it to his memory, J.G. Translator's note, Our Lady of the Flowers, Notre Dame de Fleurs, was published in a limited edition by Le Rabelette of Lyon in 1943. A trade edition revised by the author was issued by the Libraire Garimont in 1951. An English translation based on the Arbalete edition was published by the editions Maurienne of Paris in 1949. The present text, which follows the now standard Gaillemont edition, has been revised and corrected for English and American publication. Like the former, it is unabridged and unexpurgated. The translator is indebted to Richard Seaver of Grove Press for the exceptional care with which he read the translation and takes this occasion to express gratitude for the number and diversity of his suggestions. Our Lady of Flowers, Whedon, appeared before you in a five o'clock edition, his head swathed in white bands, a nun and yet a wounded pilot fallen into the rye one September day like the day when the world came to know the name of Our Lady of the Flowers. His handsome face, multiplied by the presses, swept down upon Paris and all of France to the depths of the most out-of-the-way villages, in castles and cabins, revealing to the mirthless bourgeois that their daily lives are grazed by enchanting murderers, cunningly elevated to their sleep, which they will cross by some back stairway that has abetted them, by not creaking. Beneath his picture burst the dawn of his crimes, murder one, murder two, murder three, up to six, bespeaking his secret glory and preparing his future glory. A little earlier, the Negro angel son had killed his mistress. A little later, the soldier, Maurice Piloge, killed his lover, Escudero, to rob him of something under a thousand francs. Then, For his 20th birthday, they cut off his head. While, you will recall, he thumbed his nose at the enraged executioner. Finally, a young ensign, still a child, committed treason for treason's sake. He was shot. And it is in honor of their crimes that I am writing my book. I learned only in bits and pieces of that wonderful blossoming of dark and lovely flowers. One was revealed to me by a scrap of newspaper. Another was casually alluded to by my lawyer. Another was mentioned, almost sung, by the prisoners. Their song became fantastic and funereal, a la di profundis, as much so as the plaints which they sing in the evening, as the voice which crosses the cells and reaches me blurred, hopeless, inflected. At the end of the phrases, it breaks, and that break makes it so sweet that it seems borne by the music of angels, which horrifies me, for angels fill me with horror, being, I imagine, neither mind nor matter, white, filmy and frightening, like the translucent bodies of ghosts. These murderers, now dead, have nevertheless reached me, and whenever one of these luminaries of affliction falls into my cell, 
my heart beats fast. My heart beats a loud tattoo, if the tattoo is the drum call announcing the capitulation of a city. And there follows a fervor comparable to that which wrung me and left me for some minutes grotesquely contorted. When I heard the German plane passing over the prison and the burst of the bomb which had dropped nearby, in the twinkling of an eye I saw a lone child born by his iron bird, laughingly strewing death. For him alone were unleashed the sirens, the bells, the hundred and one cannon shots reserved for the Dauphin, the cries of hatred and fear. All the cells were a-tremble, shivering, mad with terror. The prisoners pounded the doors, rolled on the floor, shrieked, screamed blasphemies, and prayed to God. I saw, as I say, or thought I saw, an eighteen-year-old child in the plain, and from the depths of my four-two-six, I smiled at him, lovingly. I do not know whether it is their faces, the real ones, which splatter the wall of my cell with a sparkling mud, but it cannot be by chance that I cut those handsome, vacant-eyed heads out of the magazines. I say vacant, for all the eyes are clear and must be sky blue, like the razor's edge to which clings a star of transparent light, blue and vacant, like the windows of buildings under construction, through which you can see the sky from the windows of the opposite wall, like those barracks which in the morning are open to all the winds which you think are empty and pure, when they are swarming with dangerous males, sprawled promiscuously on their beds. I say empty, but if they close their eyes, they become more disturbing to me than are huge prisons to the nubile maiden who passes by the high-barred windows, prisons behind which sleeps, dreams, swears, and spits a race of murderers, which makes of each cell the hissing nest of a tangle of snakes, but also a kind of confessional with a curtain of dusty surge. These eyes, seemingly without mystery, are like certain closed cities, Lyon, Zurich, and they hypnotize me as much as do empty theaters, deserted prisons, machinery at rest, deserts, for deserts are closed and do not communicate with the infinite. Men with such faces terrify me whenever I have to cross their paths warily. But what a dazzling surprise when, in their landscape, at the turning of a deserted lane, I approach, my heart racing wildly, and discover nothing, nothing but looming emptiness, sensitive and proud, like a tall foxglove. I do not know, as I have said, whether the heads there are really those of my guillotined friends, but I have recognized by certain signs that they, those on the wall, are thoroughly supple, like the lashes of whips, and rigid as glass knives, precocious as child pundits, and fresh as forget-me-nots, bodies chosen because they are possessed by terrible souls. The newspapers are tattered by the time they reach my cell, and the finest pages have been looted of their finest flowers, those pimps like gardens in May, the big, inflexible, strict pimps, their members in full bloom. I no longer know whether they are lilies or whether lilies and they our members are not totally they, so much so that in the evening, on my knees in thought, I encircle their legs with my arms. All that rigidity floors me and makes me confuse them. And the memory which I gladly give as food for my nights is of yours, which, as I caressed it, remained inert, stretched out. Only your rod unsheathed and brandished went through my mouth with the suddenly cruel sharpness of a steeple puncturing a cloud of ink, a hatpin, a breast. You did not move. You were not asleep. 
You were not dreaming. You were in flight, motionless and pale, frozen, straight, stretched out stiff on the flat bed, like a coffin on the sea. And I know that we were chased while I, all attention, felt you flow into me, warm and white, in continuous little jerks. Perhaps you were playing at coming. At the climax, you were lit up with a quiet ecstasy, which enveloped your blessed body in a supernatural nimbus, like a cloak that you pierced with your head and feet. Still, I managed to get about twenty photographs, and with bits of chewed bread I pasted them on the back of the cardboard sheet of regulations that hangs on the wall. Some are pinned up with bits of brass wire, which the foreman brings me, and on which I have to string colored glass beads. Using the same beads with which the prisoners next door make funeral wreaths, I have made star-shaped frames for the most purely criminal. In the evening, as you open your window to the street, I turn the back of all the regulations sheets toward me. Smiles and sneers alike, inexorable, enter me by all the holes I offer. Their vigor penetrates me and erects me. I live among these pits. They watch over my little routines, which, along with them, are all the family I have, and my only friends. Perhaps some lad who did nothing to deserve prison, a champion, an athlete, slipped in among the twenty by mistake. But if I have nailed him to my wall, it was because, as I see it, he has the sacred sign of the monster at the corner of his mouth or the angle of the eyelids. The flaw on the face or in the set gesture indicates to me that they may very possibly love me, for they love me only if they are monsters. And it may therefore be said that it is this stray himself who has chosen to be here. To provide them with a court and retinue, I have culled here and there, from the illustrated covers of a few adventure novels, a young Mexican half-breed, a gaucho, a Caucasian horseman, and from the pages of these novels that are passed from hand to hand, when we take our walk, clumsy drawings, profiles of pimps and apaches with a smoking bot, or the outline of a tough with a hard-on. At night, I love them, and my love endows them with life. During the day I go about my petty concerns, I am the housekeeper, watchful lest a breadcrumb or a speck of ash fall on the floor. But at night, fear of the guard who may suddenly flick on the light and stick his head through the grating compels me to take sordid precautions, lest the rustling of the sheets draw attention to my pleasure. But though my gesture may be less noble, by becoming secret it heightens my pleasure. I dawdle. Beneath the sheet my right hand stops to caress the absent face, and then the whole body of the outlaw I have chosen for that evening's delight. The left hand closes, then arranges its fingers in the form of a hollow organ, which tries to resist, then offers itself, opens up, and a vigorous body, a wardrobe, emerges from the wall, advances, and falls upon me crushes me against my straw mattress, which has already been stained by more than a hundred prisoners, while I think of the happiness into which I sink at a time when God and his angels exist. No one can tell whether I shall get out of here, or, if I do, when it will be. So, with the help of my unknown lovers, I am going to write a story. My heroes are they, pasted on the wall. They and I, who am here, locked up. As you read on, the characters, and Divine too, and Coulefoy, will fall from the wall onto my pages like dead leaves to fertilize my tale. As for their death, need I tell you about it? For all of them, it will be the death of him who, when he learned of his from the jury, merely mumbled in a Rhenish accent. I'm already beyond that. This story 
may not always seem artificial, and in spite of me you may recognize in it the call of the blood. The reason is that within my night I shall have happened to strike my forehead at some door, freeing an anguished memory that had been haunting me since the world began. Forgive me for it. This book aims to be only a small fragment of my inner life. Sometimes the cat-footed guard tosses me a hello through the gate. He talks to me, and without meaning to, tells me a great deal about my forger neighbors, about arsonists, counterfeiters, murderers, swaggering adolescents who roll on the floor, screaming, Mama, help! He slams the great shut and delivers me to a tete-a-tete with all those fine gentlemen whom he has just let slip in, and who twist and squirm in the warmth of the sheets and the drowsiness of the morning to seek the end of the thread which will unravel the motives, the system of complicity, a whole fierce and subtle mechanism which, among other neat tricks, changed a few pink little girls into white corpses. I want to mingle them, too, with their heads and legs among my friends on the wall, and to compose with them this children's tale, and to refashion in my own way, and for the enchantment of my cell, I mean that, thanks to her, my cell will be enchanted, the story of D. Vine, whom I knew only slightly, the story of Our Lady of the Flowers, and, never fear, my own story. Description of Our Lady of the Flowers, height, five feet, seven inches, weight, 156 pounds, oval face, blonde hair, Blue eyes, matte complexion, perfect teeth, straight nose.